The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. FMCSA held a public meeting about predatory towing practices Friday morning. Those representing truck drivers said protections are needed, and those representing the towing industry countered with their concerns. We cover both sides today. The OOIDA Foundation's latest quarterly report backs up what you've likely been feeling, that the freight market remains in a rut. We'll get some insight from Andrew King of the Foundation. FMCSA wants to do something about predatory lease purchase agreements as well as predatory towing, and that process has already begun through a set of public meetings. Mark Schremer of Landline Magazine joins us for a recap. And finally, Marty Ellis is talking about some serious topics, including how to reinvent or rebrand yourself, the importance of trust, and the difficulties you can run into when you trust the wrong GPS. I'll talk with the man who drives the spirit of the American trucker. And now, here's Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration held a public meeting this Friday morning aimed at addressing the lack of transparency within towing fees. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg got things started and pointed out that predatory towing is an issue they want to tackle because it has far-ranging effects. This department has been clear in our support for protections against predatory towing junk fees. Truckers often have to travel far from home to deliver the goods that everybody depends on. In the event that their truck gets towed, they may not have any relationship or familiarity with the towing company that moves their vehicle. Until they get that vehicle back, their job, and really their livelihood, is put on hold. Tow truck drivers also play an essential role in keeping our roads safe by removing disabled vehicles. But... In some cases, some players in the towing space recognize and exploit the vulnerability of these situations. Of course, there are necessary and fair costs associated with the towing of a commercial vehicle. But some companies have seen an opportunity to charge exorbitant fees, even in the tens of thousands of dollars, before returning the vehicle back to the truck driver. That isn't right. It isn't fair. And it's why we recently urged the FTC to ban predatory towing fees that unfairly increase costs for commercial vehicle owners and operators. This includes hiding fees until the tow is completed, charging for unnecessary or worthless services, or imposing an excessive number of fees for excessive amounts just because a towing company thinks that they can get away with it. The Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association has spoken out about the predatory towing problem for years and cited cases where truckers are charged more than $100,000 for towing and recovery services after being in a crash. Referred to as third-party or non-consensual tows, truckers are not able to select the towing company or negotiate prices in those situations, putting the motor carrier at the mercy of whichever towing company is next on the local law enforcement rotation. Doug Morris, OIDA Director of State Government Affairs, spoke at Friday's meeting. He said truck drivers and carriers face issues they have little to no control over every day. He calls them stressors. The stressor of not knowing whether or not they will have a safe and secure parking space at the end of their day, the stressor of ever-changing burdensome regulations from state, federal, and municipalities, and the stressor of not knowing whether a shipper or receiver will allow them to use the restroom or take a break when they're locked. I can go on and on and on, but yes, predatory towing is one of those stressors. Not knowing if I break down today will a fair and legitimate tower tow my equipment and whether or not they will hold that equipment and their cargo hostage for payment. I hope you all had a chance to read a recent report from the American Transportation Research Institute, which was referenced earlier. It revealed that nearly 30% of crash-related tows include some form of predatory towing, or predatory billing, rather. Many of the victims in that report are our members. These members and all drivers want to be treated fairly and respectfully. When a tow bill, which should be no more than $1,000, turns into an invoice of tens of thousands of dollars, there's a problem. And there are legitimate towers out here. We've worked with a lot of legitimate towers to get legislation in different states like Maryland and other states, and we will continue to work with them. When we leave this meeting today and go back to our offices, 
and workspaces. Let's not check the box of another meeting and move on to the next topic of the day. Let's do something about it. OIDA will continue to work with legislators, stakeholders, and interest parties to stop this practice. There was a healthy discussion during Friday morning's meeting from stakeholders on both sides of this issue. Representatives from the towing industry gave their side of things through opening remarks and throughout the public comment period. Bill Johnson, president of the Towing and Recovery Association of America, told those gathered that they take issue with this idea that predatory towing is a widespread problem. First, DOT's position that predatory towing is widespread is based on a single, biased, and industry-funded study. The study has drastically overestimated the number of so-called predatory tows that occur by relying on a self-submitted invoices provided by aggrieved CMV operators. No federal agency has seriously vetted this data, nor conducted any other evidentiary review to establish the scope of the perceived issue. The ATR study relied on self-submitted convenience sampling of 350 motor carrier respondents in ATRI's contact database, only 20 of whom re- responded. For context, in 2016, FMCSA registered 524,058 interstate motor carriers. We know the ATR an- analyst was insufficient and non representational because it comprised only 490 toes. I want to reiterate, 20 respondents out of 500, over 500,000 companies. Toes are performed every day to say nothing of an annual basis in the United States. It also doesn't distinguish consent, non-consent toes. So we don't know which invoices fall under state or federal jurisdiction. TR, TRAA believes FMCSA should conduct non-industry funded research on the frequency with which improper billing truly occurs. This is a necessary first step to determining what remedies might be necessary. Johnson and others in the towing industry did say there are bad actors out there, but the complexity of the industry as a whole makes the environment difficult for everyone. Johnson himself is calling for a task force to look more closely at the issue. Ultimately, FMCSA does want to do something. What that looks like remains to be seen. Brian Stansbury, Deputy General Counsel for the USDOT, acknowledged that most commercial truck drivers do not have a lot of room for air on the roads. The last thing we want is for commercial vehicle drivers not to call a tow truck because they're worried about what the economic impact would be. Stansbury also said this issue and others being addressed do not fall under the FMCSA's purview per se, but that it is all connected. Safety is our North Star. It always has been. It always will be. Promoting safety is what FMCSA is here to do. And there are ways that we've always done it involving promulgating rules, enforcement actions, and that's what we've always done and always will do. But what this administration has tried to focus on is taking a more holistic view of safety. And one aspect of safety that is really shown time and time again through research is that the safest drivers are experienced drivers with a track record of being a safe driver. They're also in an industry, though, that can be brutal. Um, This is a very challenging industry. I don't have to tell anybody in this room how hard it is to make a living as a truck driver. And so at FMCSA, we want to be thoughtful about what we can do to make this a more livable industry that will encourage the safer drivers to stay in the industry. Because when we keep safe drivers on the road, our roads are safer. Stansberry later said he wanted more input from stakeholders about whether a task force on this issue would be helpful and asked that those in the towing industry submit what they think best practices would be and how best to isolate and deal with bad actors. FMCSA plans to keep the comment window for this meeting open through at least July 1st so others can submit their thoughts. We have a link at LandlineNow.com. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Next, Andrew King of the OOIDA Foundation discusses the freight market. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Every year, 28 million people are trafficked globally. The Your Roads, Their Freedom campaign seeks to raise awareness in the transport industry. Truck and bus drivers, be vigilant on the roads. If you see something suspicious, text 233-733 or be free.
Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash 4MoreMiles. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now, welcome back. The OIDA Foundation has been hard at work, as they always are, diving into issues that affect a lot of people, including maybe even you, every single day. They recently put out a one-page report on just how bad predatory towing has gotten. And to top it off, the foundation also put out its quarterly market report, looking at how things fared from January to March. Joining us with all the details, Andrew King, Assistant Director of the OIDA Foundation. Andrew, always good to see you. Yeah, always good to be here. Thanks for being here. We're going to start with the quarterly market update. This is uh, kind of a relatively new thing that the foundation has been doing and putting together and putting out there in the world. I want to ask you first off, because we talk pretty much every month about the monthly market report. This is a quarterly report. Talk about a little bit about how they differ. And I think maybe more importantly, what the information tells you when to look at it yeah. Kind of on a bigger scale. Now, that's a good question. The monthly report focuses mainly on types of uh, freight. So it's going to focus on, you know, dry van, flatbed, and refrigerated, as well as trucking overall and freight market overall. And this one, the quarterly market update, probably the, the biggest difference is that we're focusing on types of operations instead. So we're going to focus on those who have their own authority those who are leased on, and company drivers. And the other big difference besides that is <clears throat> it's much shorter. Mm-hmm. So uh, because it's a quarterly report, the, the data is not as frequent. So they talk about data in terms of frequency. Obviously, something that's being published monthly or even weekly is very high-frequency data. And so it has its benefits, but it does have some drawbacks in that a lot of the things that we report on, the next month they'll be readjusted. Whereas something that's coming out on more of a quarterly or even sometimes annual basis, there's less need for that adjustment. So maybe it's not as frequent as things that are coming out monthly, but it also gives you a little bit more accuracy. So it's it's kind of like you gotta pick your 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 battle, your balance here and what you want. So the the metrics that we are using in this report are different than what we use in the monthly because they're not as highly frequent. But sure. at the same time, they do give us insight and visibility into aspects of the industry that we don't necessarily get with the monthly report. Well, and I think you can see, too, the trend lines become a little more defined with the things that you're yes, talking about here. absolutely. Um, a good example of that is with truckload volumes, right? Um, yes. According to the first quarter, according to what I'm looking at here, the volume's creeping up ever so slowly, but still in the negative when it comes to changes compared to the year before. I do see some positive signs here because, again, we're kind of trending upward in terms of what we're seeing there. Is that a stretch? What's your take no, on what you No, yeah, see there are some positive signs. It's still in the negative territory, yeah. as you mentioned. So for the owner-operator segment, we use C.H. Robinson's figures. Obviously, they are kind of a behemoth when it comes to freight, and one of their primary customers is going to be or clients is going to be owner operators. A lot of people use them to uh, for for freight, and so they they give us really good visibility into what's happening for our owner operator members who have their own authority. They deal with over thirty billion dollars of freight every year, so they're just like you mentioned. Their truckload volume year over year percentage change is like creeping up into the positive territory. It's getting ever so close to that. I mean, you can see there was a steep drop off. In 2022, like we've already talked about in other things, but it is giving some positive indication that volumes are kind of starting to reach maybe a parity, which is obviously a very good thing. We're still a ways away from that next cycle taking place, but it does give us maybe some light at the end of the tunnel that this isn't going to last forever, but it's just, it's not going <laughs> to happen right yet. now. Yeah, it's not. We're not, we're not there yet. Not right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean the same thing kind of holds true with when you look at um, you know 
price out there, cost changes, right? Again, yes. creeping up, but still not where we want to be. For owner-operators, yes. we're talking about particular. Correct. So one of the things that they report on in their financial statements is this price and cost. So price for them is what shippers pay C.H. Robinson to move their freight, and then the cost to C.H. Robinson is what they actually pay owner-operators to haul it. And so you can see this dynamic where they go side by side. And usually when the cost is above the price, that's usually a good indicator, but they're still below that zero and we need it to go above that. But it is trending in that way. In fact, it has increased over the last three or so quarters. So that's positive, yeah. um, like you've mentioned. And so there is some good, there are some good vibes, hopefully, that you can get from something like this. Yeah. Um, real quick here, too. Leased on owner operators is a, is a focus of this quarterly report as well. Uh, you use data from Landstar, and there is a reason for that, and I can let you explain that, too. But um, essentially, what we're seeing from the owner operator side of things kind of reflects what we're from the, uh, sorry, leased on owner operators, kind of reflects what we're seeing on the other side yes. of things as well. Again, kind of a bottoming out, maybe a slight increase here. But, again, not where we want to be. Right. Yes. And, and that's a good point. And so some of these are, are fairly similar. Some are just a slightly different at the same time because they are a different type of operation. But we use Landstar. As most people know, they are a very large carrier, and they use leased on owner operators. They call them BCOs or business capacity owners. But basically, it's a leased on owner operator. And so they actually give us a good snapshot onto what, you know, obviously they don't represent – the whole market. And that's the thing when you're looking at data and you're trying to gain understanding and insight into where the market is, is you want to get the most broad representative data as you can for the segment that you're looking at. And so Landstar kind of provides that for this particular segment. And yeah, it, it follows the same pattern with C.H. Robinson. Number of loads per quarter has drastically declined, uh, even more so than C.H. Robinson's uh, and it still hasn't quite picked up just yet. And the same thing with the number of trucks that uh, B BCOs provide. Um, but the one thing that is somewhat positive is the revenue per load has basically been fairly flat. It's still declining year over year for the last, you know, several quarters. Yeah. But if you look at the actual figure, it's starting to flatline, which is basically what we've been saying in the monthly report as well, that it's finding this bottom. And we really need that in order to, you know, go up. And so I think from what you can take with this data that we're presenting here, as well as our other data, is that we're not going to get worse. <laughs> knock on wood. Find <laughs> knock on wood. To knock yeah. On. yeah. Yeah. It's not going to get worse. Um, it's not necessarily going to get better right away, like we've talked about, but that will happen eventually. And as we've talked about before, this recovery or whatever term you want to use is going to be a slow recovery. It's not going yes. to be an overnight thing. Again, barring any sort of some insane kind of crazy thing that happens things. again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's – I've seen some interesting articles here just recently by our friend uh, Jason Miller, who's a professor at Michigan State University. On He kind of looked at past, like, hurricanes and things and how they actually move the market or don't move the market. And so even things like that don't necessarily move it as much as we think that they would. And, of course, that's not something we, that we want to actually yeah, happen or, right, or right. take place. But the bi other big thing is just, you know, what the um, – you know, the, the interest rate is set up by the Federal Reserve. And so, unfortunately, if anyone's not familiar already, they, they put out uh, news yep. here recently that they are projecting only one rate cut this year. Yep. And that's still a maybe rather than earlier it was three. And that actually is a headwind for trucking and freight in general because usually when that is high – uh, manufacturers and others are not going to invest as much in sure. equipment and upgrades and things like that that do generate a lot of freight. Time will tell. We'll keep an eye on it. But at some point here, as we keep saying, we will be talking about um, sunnier days Yes, with all of this. We'll wait for those. Uh, let's shift gears here for a moment. I wanted to talk to you about this one-page report that the foundation recently put out about predatory towing. Uh, you teamed up with ATRI, I believe, for this one, the American Transportation Research Institute. This analysis has some eye-opening figures for me, things that we kind of knew, but putting numbers with it, I think, really does bring some value to it about predatory towing. Um, this report 
Can you talk a little bit about how it came to be, I guess, to begin yeah. with? Yeah. So this is something that Atri uh, put together. They, they finalized it in the end of 2023, so it's very recent. They have a research advisory committee, which actually the foundation is a part of, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. And this was one of the primary things that they wanted to research for 2023 is predatory towing and, you know, What's exactly happening right now um, out there and what to what extent and are there things that you could do to mitigate it or help, you know, bring it down or there's some strategies that people could have. And so that's kind of where it came from. And then they had in their, their methodology, they wanted to do four different things. So they compiled a compendium of all the different state regulations on towing, mm-hmm. which is actually very useful. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, checking that out. And then they also did a survey of truck drivers, and then they looked at invoices of actual towing bills, and that was provided mainly by OOIDA. And they looked at about 500 different towing invi- uh, invoices from like a, a period of like a year or so. Uh, everything from from just your, your casual tow away $250 bill to things that are like way more complex that are well over $100,000 uh, with complex recovery and, and even hazmat spills. And and I even personally just, you know, when I talk to claims people, we, we have people who come in and share and truck to success, and they have seen bills that are even higher than the ones yeah. that they mention. So it it is a, a huge issue. And like you said, this really helps give us a little understanding of how prevalent it is. Uh, Nearly and maybe, a third. Yes, uh, 30%. Yeah. Basically, of all the invoices they looked at, they deemed to be predatory. Yeah. Because they had excessive charges in different areas. The two most common ones, I think, were were miscellaneous costs and administrative fees. So yeah. one thing that they noticed as they were going through the, the invoices is a lot of times things wouldn't be itemized. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you what the cost is for, what equipment, and then they didn't tell you the, the the rate that they're charging yep. for that. And so they're basically throwing in all this stuff that you can't fight them on because you don't really know what what's it even there for. Yeah. And then administrative fees where they're charging administrative fee for like everything under the sun, you know. Right. And it's a, a really high percentage of the total cost uh, in some of these bills. And so those are things that they definitely highlight to to watch out for. Yeah. Just to go over these numbers here real quick, nearly 30%, as you mentioned there, of crash-related tows involves some form of predatory towing. That more than doubles with invoices of more than 30000 which kind of makes sense when you think about it. Yes. But that can add up real quick there. Um, and then the average total pre-tax bill for a crash-related tow was $8,900. Compared to an average bill of eighteen thousand for tows identified as predatory, so again, you can see the the big difference there uh, yes. of those kind of things that you're talking about there. Um, and, and the thing about this one page report and what Atri's doing is there, you know, sunlight being the best form of sanitation or, or whatever that phrase is here, <laughs> bringing this to light and yes. hoping that it yeah. brings awareness and change. Um, yes. And I think anybody, any rational person looking at these numbers is going to realize real quick, this is a problem. Uh, what can we do about it? And as we were talking earlier, it really starts with the individual truck driver themselves and staying out of that trouble, right? Can you talk about Yeah, about there that? are a few things obviously you can do um, is make sure that your insurance policy covers things like that. Um, now, they did find in this research that even if insurance does cover those charges, sometimes the invoices are so excessive that it doesn't cover everything, and so it leaves the driver or the carrier responsible. So that's something to check for. Make sure that your your plan covers that. Uh, understand your plan. But also, just like, simple things that kind of make sense. You know, make sure you're documenting everything. You know, while they're doing the recovery process, did they bring out equipment that wasn't necessary? Did they bring out equipment and it wasn't even being used? You know, mm-hmm. these are things that can help you fight that, th- those those fees uh, are really, really important. You know, those aren't necessarily maybe groundbreaking, but, and another thing that, that comes, uh, comes to mind is, you know, one of the biggest issues with this towing problem is non-consensual towing, right? So you have a wreck and the police need to move it. So they're going to call the company. And sometimes these companies will come and they'll have these forms. They want you to sign these consent forms, right? Don't sign that. And like we were talking, you know, previously, I know it's a stressful situation, a lot's going on, but you don't want to sign that to make it seem like it's a consensual tow when it isn't. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. OID.com 
slash foundation is where you can go for access to these reports and more. Andrew, a pleasure as always. We'll see you next time. Thank you. We'll take a break here, but Landline Now continues in just a moment. Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2024 when you purchase Loadboard Pro. Attention professional drivers, do you owe money to the IRS? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. Call for help now, 855-976-4291. That's 855-976-4291. Landline now. Welcome back. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has been busy in recent weeks getting feedback about two problems in the industry, predatory towing and predatory lease purchase agreements. We've got new developments on both issues and joining us to break down all the latest is our returning champion, Mark Schirmer. <laughs> Mark is senior editor at Landline Magazine and he joins us here in Studio A. It's a beautiful day, Mark. How you doing? <laughs> it's not bad. It's not a bad day at all. But, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, we... It's uh, the theme here today is, is predatory, and that's that's something that truckers have to deal with a lot. And uh, I know we'll get into a little bit more, but um, Doug Morris from OIDA, I think, really uh, you know hit out of the park of of talking about all the stressors that truck drivers have to deal with, and having to deal with whether it's a predatory lease purchase agreement, uh, predatory tow, fraudulent brokers. That's 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 stressful things that that makes the highways a little bit less safe uh, yeah. because you know truck drivers are having to deal with that stuff every day. And the good thing is that FMCSA is taking a serious look at both of these issues, and we'll take them one by one here, starting with predatory towing. Uh, they held a public meeting at the USDOT headquarters in D.C. Friday morning, asking for input from stakeholders in yeah. the trucking industry, truck drivers, people from the towing industry, trying to figure out what the problem is, what they can do about it, and what that might look like. Uh, we've seen action on this on the state level in recent months, but again, looks like we're getting closer to maybe something. The federal government moves slowly. We know that. But what? You, you don't say. I know. Breaking news. Um, but they're, they're talking about this, and they do seem serious about doing something about it. Yeah, I'll do kind of two sides here. Sure. One thing, let me give a compliment to the Department of Transportation and FMCSA for, as they mentioned, taking a more holistic approach uh, to safety and understanding that there are other aspects other than just rule, comply with rule. Like there's there's more to it a, a lot of times. And like going in, like I said, with Doug Morris, OIDA, bringing up these stressors, bringing up the fact that, um, you know, the safest drivers are the experienced drivers. Uh, what are the things that we can make sure that they want to uh, stay in the career so that they will be a safe driver as opposed to constant turnover and a constant new driver who is going to be less safe? Um, so I, I appreciate all of that. But at the same time, I will say whether it is about lease purchase, whether it is about uh, predatory towing, uh, fraudulent brokers, whatever it is, they're listening. Mm -hmm. They've had meetings, truck parking, had meetings. They're listening. They're saying they, they really care. But I am also with Doug Morris on, okay, we can't just check the box that we've had a meeting. Yeah. Real action has to take place. And, and some of this, maybe it will. I'm not saying that it won't. Um, I mean, these things do take time. You can't just snap your fingers. Um, obviously, we're seeing with the towing meeting, there's plenty of opposition yeah. Um, yeah. out there. So, and, and they do. And there are, we do have to say, there are legitimate good towing companies out there that are trying to do uh, things the right way. We can't ignore that. Um, but they, those good towers need to get out of the way to let there be enforcement on the bad guys and, yeah. and to get those guys out of the industry. Cause that'd be better for them too. Uh, it does, you know, I heard, uh, several of, uh, representatives of towing companies that were there saying, Hey, there's just a few bad apples. It shouldn't bring down the whole industry. You're right. Let's get those 
people out of there. Let's mm-hmm. set up some um, ground rules to make sure that those uh, you know fraudulent type of companies aren't allowed to do that it's so that it doesn't hurt the good name of so many towing companies out there, a lot of them that are members of OIDA, uh, that are trying to do it right. You know, let's let's make sure that we can set this up in a way that is fair to everyone. Yeah, and I think that's the underlying question about all of this is what, again, what does that look like? What can FMCSA realistically do on this? As you point out, the conversations, the fact that they're being had at this level is encouraging We've seen and we've talked with Keith Goble, your colleague, about this multiple times in recent months. Different states, uh, you know, taking a whack at this issue, Florida yeah. being one uh, notorious for this practice. Um, so we're seeing some progress here and there. But I think the underlying issue is, again, what do we do about it? And what does that even look like? I'm not sure FMCSA or the USDOT knows the answer to that. I'm not sure anybody knows the answer to that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, you know, oversight of the states and what they're doing and rates and non-consensual. Again, I, I, and you may not know this answer yeah. either. You probably don't. But I think that's a question we all have to be asking ourselves, especially as we look to make recommendations to FMCSA and the USDOT about what would make the situation better. Um, again, you know, what does that what does that look like? And I'm, I, I don't have the answer. You know, I'm not sure what the exact plan, uh, your best plan would be uh, going forward. But what I will say is, um, you know, there I think there was one of the commenters uh, from a towing company today that was uh, saying, you know, we already, um, you know, have the solution. The solution is letting the uh, states um, you know, make the decisions. And, and that's fine. And a lot of times, um, I, I do think that allowing the states to make decisions on things, uh, in a lot of instances, can be a good thing and the right way to go. But what we've seen here, that's what's been in place for a long time, yet we're still having to have this meeting today. Yeah. So that means not all the states are taking care of it the way that they're supposed to. Um, you know, when I was on this beat for, for the longest time, I think it was, and I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I feel like it was about half the states that there, if you had, you know, uh, a tow bill that you thought should only be 20000 but they're telling you it's 45000 there's nothing... There was no nothing you could do. There was no, um, you know, place that you can file the complaint yeah. or go back, have it a board, look at it. Um, now, OIDA has done some great work in the last decade or so that has created some of that, uh, you know. Uh, framework. Yeah, yeah, the framework and just kind of, um, you know, some chance where you can go and say, have somebody look at it and and say, is this correct? Uh, what's what's the what's the fair uh, charge for this? Um, you know, some sort of checks and balances, and that has been created in a lot of states because of OIDA. But there's still a lot of states that don't have that framework, don't have those protections in place. And I would say, at the very least, every state needs to have something like that. But exactly how to make all of this work? Uh, you know, I don't know. I do understand, um, you know, uh, from the towing perspective on, on a lot of these where, you know, it is. They're work, it's a hard job. They're sure, working 24-7. Yeah. They could be called at any time. So if they're on one of those police uh, towing rotations, um, you know, they might not have to, uh, you know, just it's three in the morning. Nobody wants to get woken up and have to do that type yep, of work. Yeah. But that's something that they're doing every day. And there are good companies out there. Um, you know, one thing about this, and I think a lot of our uh, listeners um, know exactly what we're talking about here, but um, I, I still want to kind of back up. When we talk about most of these predatory fees or predatory towing, what we're dealing with is what they call third-party tows or non-consensual tows. It's uh, a tractor trailer uh, either has been in a crash or gets stuck for whatever reason, and law enforcement says, we got to get this this truck off the road, we got to get it out of here um, because it's a, it's a hazard being, you know, halfway on the road or whatever uh, the situation is. Um, So they're calling, you know, a tow company that's on their rotation list. The truck driver does not get to choose which tow company is coming out. Uh, The tow driver, you know, the trucking uh, trucker doesn't get to compare prices, doesn't get to negotiate. So whichever you're just playing roulette, literally playing roulette yep. on that. You're that, at their mercy, yeah. and and you might be a truck driver. You might be from New York, and you're in West Virginia, 
and you've maybe never even been in West Virginia before, but that's where the crash yeah. or the incident happens. And now all of a sudden you're dealing with this and, and you don't, you know, and, and they're holding your cargo hostage, yeah. potentially they're, they're, they're holding your livelihood, your, your tractor trailer. And, um, until you pay these fees, whether you think they're fair or correct or not, you know, that's, that's that, what it's going to be. Yeah. And so that's, yeah. you know, and, and that, that's why this issue is so important. Yeah. Clearly when you've got a model in which so many people are one incident away from going bankrupt and losing their yeah. livelihood, clearly there's something wrong with the model. That's my last point on this. And, and, you know, we'll see what happens here. But again, the conversations are being had. We'll certainly have this conversation again. I know, uh, as, uh, this process moves forward here. Speaking of broken models, the <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, Truck Leasing Task Force has been holding meetings for several months now. Something in, uh, interesting and noteworthy, I think, happened in the last one with two members saying out loud that they came in at the start of this process with one opinion. Now they have a completely different opinion based on what they've heard over the past several months. I know you've been following this, and uh, it was an interesting turn of events, I think. Yeah, it, it was really uh, kind of refreshing because so many times, um, you know, we talk about it uh, in Congress and, you know, just politics in general. People are so far on other sides of the spectrum of arguments so often that um, no matter what you say on either side, they're just not going to listen to reason. They're not going to even budge over an inch or two the other way. Um, but here we had... This, this task force looking into uh, lease purchase agreements um, where the carrier, you know, holds the loan over the driver. Um, they don't actually, in a lot of, in these bad cases, they don't have any control over their business, but they're an owner operator. And uh, they're, you know, a lot of times they don't, um, most of the time, they don't end up walking away owning the truck. Um, they're basically paying the company um, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for the right to, uh, you know, work for them. And what, what we have is it, it's just, it's just a situation where it's, it's, it's so fraudulent, fraudulent. And we, we just kind of, they, they need to stop and, um, you know, make some sense out of this. But what's nice about this is that we had two people on this task force that were originally on the side of, we need to keep these agreements and now they've seen the light, they've seen the evidence, they've seen the documents, and they've said, you know, I agree with you guys. I think there is a problem here. We do need to make a change. And that's so refreshing. You don't see that anymore. Yeah. And again, it, it seems like we're getting close to a consensus there, and we may, be, may even already be there. When you have that situation in a group like this, they're able to take that consensus and actually make some real recommendations I hate to compare this committee <laughs> to the underride committee, which we've talked about before, which has been, I mean, it's been a mess. I think yeah. uh, that's pretty safe to say. This one, it feels like we're going to come to some sort of consensus here and some real recommendations. And many of the members in that group have said from the outset, this needs to be just put away. It needs to be abolished, this this lease purchase model. Yeah, the, that whole situation where the same you know, company that would hold in the truck that over you that is telling you how, you know, uh, whether you have a load this week or not, that being the same one holding the loan over you, that's what they're talking about, yeah. uh, you know, abolishing. Right, now, right, if, right. You, if you want to go to a, a third party and and lease a truck that has nothing to do with the carrier, yep. um, then that, you know, that should be fine. Um, but yeah, they are um, uh, looking at just getting rid of that because it's just so predatory. You hear all of these these horror stories. Um, you know how how many thousands of dollars these truckers have lost. The fact that they you, they they've been lied to from the beginning to even sign the contract. Yeah, they don't have a right to an attorney to go look at it, and you know, all this time they're told, "Hey, if you're a real hard worker, you want to be on the lease purchase. You want to you know make business for yourself, and uh, you know using this entrepreneurial yeah. spirit, and snake all, oil, all yeah. of that stuff." Um, yeah. It, it is really nice to see that uh, we have a task force that has looked at the evidence and said, this is the way we should go. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll talk about it again, Mark. We appreciate it as always. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Our thanks to Mark Schrimmer. Check out his work at Landline.media every day and in every issue of Landline Magazine. We're running out of time here, but fear not. 
Landline Now continues right after this. Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top-quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. Every week, we check in with Marty Ellis, who drives OOIDA's tour truck, the spirit of the American trucker. Marty is on his way to another truck show, but in the meanwhile, he has a few more serious topics on his mind. That includes how to reinvent or rebrand yourself or your business during tough times, the importance of trust in business, as well as the difficulties you can run into when you trust the wrong GPS. Carolina West to Denver, up to Bangor West to Austin, coast to coast, sea to sea, sail on, sail on. Well, Marty, how are you doing? I am lovely, Mark. And you? I'm doing great. Thank you, sir. Um, I know you've been off the road a little bit lately with uh, with some repairs on the trailer there at the Spirit, but uh, does it look like you're going to get back on the road? Yeah, <laughs> it does. So I uh, should be at the Ohio uh, Vintage Truck Reunion uh, Friday and Saturday, the 21st and 22nd. Uh, it's in Ashland, Ohio. On Friday, uh, basically the gates open at 1 p.m. And uh, there's uh, going to be a swap meet, a truck model contest, uh, ice cream social in the evening, and a trucking movie in the evening. And then uh, on Saturday, it's 8 to 4. And uh, same thing with the swap meet and the truck model contest. Then they're going to also have a loud horn contest, a slow race. And I saw for the first time the first time i went there and it's it's interesting <laughs> but yeah basically you see how slow you can go uh along a road instead of how fast so it, it's interesting uh and there's a jake off uh I have to be careful when i say that but uh, very careful <laughs> um yeah so apparently they're gonna run the J uh, jake breaks there in front of uh what they call moselle hall there and uh then uh, in the afternoon, they'll do the presentations and the awards, and uh, then they'll also uh, have a, a light show uh, Saturday night and a movie uh, after dark. So should be a lot of fun. Last time I went, it was, so should see a lot of good people out there and a lot of people I know and hopefully some, some new friends as we go along. Absolutely, although... I hope that this isn't close to any residential areas because with a Jake break contest and, and a loud horn contest, the, uh, the potential for disturbing the neighbors is pretty high. It, <laughs> it would be. It's out at the uh, fairgrounds there in Ashland, so everybody should be okay. But I'm going to be guessing that there's going to be some folks in the area that may not like it as much as others, but I think it'll be okay. It's only a two-day event. Or maybe just wondering what the heck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then maybe come out and check it out. Well, there you go. Well, let's talk about some of the things that uh, have been coming to your attention lately. And, and one of them that you mentioned in an email earlier, I thought was a pretty good topic here. Um, of course, you know, we, we all know that the trekking industry has been in kind of a slump for a long time. And you mentioned reinventing yourself or your business, and I think that's a really good topic. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I was talking with a, a, a couple of folks about uh, some different organizations and that basically having to reinvent themselves, and but people can too. And we were just kind of discussing on what needs to be done 
when you do let's just we'll just use a business reinventing themselves maybe they have had some challenges in the past maybe some missteps and all and how do you go about uh trying to rebrand yourself and also once you have kind of rebranded then how do you build up your clientele again and we were really discussing on it's it's all a matter of trust because if you've lost people's trust it it is really really hard to get back and you have to make that eff- extra effort to really show everybody around you what you're doing and a lot of times it's it's explaining kind of what you did wrong what happened uh and then what kind of mistakes were made how did we learn from our mistakes and how are we going to prevent them from happening again and i think some of the people don't really put a lot of effort into the explaining how and why something happened and also how they're going to fix it and and how they're going to uh make sure it doesn't happen again. Too many of them kind of skip some of those steps. They just want to put a new name on or kind of just refresh everything and say, okay, we're back. And I don't believe it works very often, you know, in, um, in, in our situations out here, you really do have to put forth that extra effort. And I think if more businesses and even people, you know, we've all, you know, made mistakes in the past and all. And, but if you're going to kind of really reinvent yourself, you have to kind of see where, you know, where you're at, uh, why you made those decisions before and explain to people what that maybe tipping point was to change things around. And it's a difficult area. And some people don't really care to look back in and say, okay, what did we do wrong? But they really have to. And, but in talking to the fo- those folks that I was talking to about it, they they really feel that that business or people have to really work on rebuilding the trust, and I think that's the core issue is rebuilding that. Absolutely, and and you know you mentioned admitting what you've done and and talking about how you're going to fix it. And there's that old uh, uh, joke that the first step of any twelve step program is admitting you have a problem. Until you know what the problem is, how are you going to fix it? That's true. Yep. You know? Absolutely. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left, and uh, you had brought up another topic. And uh, boy, is is it one that I think will get people's blood boiling here. I wish we had more than two minutes to talk about it. But truck GPS versus Google Maps or Waze and, and so so on. And boy, the number of people that go astray because they follow just a general non-trucking GPS – um, uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, have you heard of a particular case where this has been a problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we see it kind of every day on social media on where a truck can get in trouble and you can easily because we don't do, you know, I've complained about signage and I'll keep complaining about signage probably till I kick off. But, uh, there's so many times that a truck driver doesn't see signs saying no trucks and if there's no sign no saying no trucks well i guess it's okay and the gps is telling you to go there and i've had examples especially recently going out toward the northeast where the truck gps told me wrong but if i would have been watching the ways and went where it said to go it was actually would have been the better choice of the two uh, GPSs and it's it's not that way all the time that that's the sad thing you can't depend on any of it uh, even the truck ones you cannot totally depend on and we don't do a lot of talking amongst ourselves anymore to find out you know uh, we used to talk on the radio a lot and holler at people and say hey anybody know the area and you can get help that way or at the round table at the truck stops on your way to that uh, destination, but that doesn't happen anymore. So we're relying on uh, GPS, uh, Google Maps, ways, uh, you know, the truck GPSs, and, and of course every truck driver ought to at least have one truck GPS and keep it updated. But uh, it's not a fail safe. 
<laughs> and of course, use some common sense. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we're out of time here, Marty. Any final words before you ride off into the sunset? Hey guys, just be kind to one another and give that guy next to you a break. Brothers of the highway, children of the wind. Once again, that was Marty Ellis, who drives OOIDA's tour truck, the spirit of the American trucker. You can find Marty's next stop on our show and every day at our website, landlinenow.com. That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Capital Reman is your leading source for quality remanufactured engines and components. Capital Reman stands ready to serve all OOIDA members to help reduce costly engine repairs or replacement. Visit CapitalReman.com today and use code OOIDA10 to save. Get the most power performance out of your rig with Howes Diesel Defender. It provides maximum lubricity and contains specialized IDX4 detergent to clean and prevent deposits and safely removes harmful water. Visit HowesProducts.com for more information. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.